set apart this is our series that we will start for four week series what we wanted to accomplish is to be able to um, you know declare um, give you know uh, uh, this, what the scripture talks about uh, explain what the scripture says about the holiness of God and how that applies uh, in our lives to be able to give practical application and so that our lives could be uh, an honor and a, a ple pleasure to God and so when you say set apart it means uh, to be distinct one of a kind exceptional unparalleled so these are some of the words that would come to mind when you think of uh, these two words set apart um, and uh, what does it mean to be set apart okay and we'll talk about that in scripture when when we say uh, one is holy one is set apart what does the Bible have to say about that? I, uh, our pastors were thinking about this week. Some of the things that, you know, would, would sort of explain or maybe illustrate this, this idea of set apart. When, you, when something's distinct, something's exceptional, something unparalleled or, or, or one of a kind. Um, we were Googling some, uh, uh, some articles, one of which that showed up was this, the perfect pink. It was a pink diamond, all right? I only heard about this uh, from Dr. Uh, Detective Clouseau uh, in Pink Panther. Uh, but, but really, there's such a thing that a, a perfect pink diamond, um, and this would cost about $23.2 million. Uh, that's how much it costs. How many of you want to have one of these, all right? And so this, this is one-of-a-kind diamond. This is... Uh, unprecedented, unparalleled, unrivaled. So in this sense, in this category, in the category of diamonds, this would be set apart, okay? Now, um, I have another picture. I don't know if you'll recognize this person. Anybody recognize this person? Yeah, we, uh, years ago, there was a, a, um, uh, an actress that was really distinct. This is Elizabeth Taylor. Um, some of you might not uh, know him anymore, those of you who are younger, but she passed away a few years ago, and the, the, she had the distinction of having purple or violet eyes. Uh, this was way before there was Photoshop. This was way before there were online editing tools. Uh, she had a distinction. It was one of a kind. Her eyes uh, were purple, okay? So I don't know if they put that in the museum or after she passed away, All right, but uh, she did have wonderful, beautiful eyes. Now, while, you know, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Patrick, we were thinking of ways to, um, what are the other things that are set apart? We had a hard time. There are different categories for different things that would set them apart. But when you talk about God being set apart and holy, He is on, on a different level. He is in a, there's no comparison. In fact, there's no, no category that would even match with what, what we will try to describe Him as being set apart. And so the next four weeks, starting today, we'll talk about the holiness of God. Next week, in the, in the next weeks after today, we will talk about the process by which God will make us holy and sanctifies us and changes us and transforms us to become more like Jesus. And so uh, today, as I said, we'll talk about the holiness of God. Now, the question I want to ask us today, because you might think, you know, holiness, that's such a, an archaic concept. Is holiness now old school, right? In fact, uh, in, in the book of J.I. Packer, uh, Rediscovering God, he's, he asked the question, is holiness passe? Is it something that, yeah, it's, it's nice, it's a good concept then, but I don't know if that still will work to this day. Let me give you an illustration. Every year um, in this church, we have our me and my dad camp. Those of you who are dads here, some of you might have, you know, participated in our Me and My Dad camps. Um, and every year for, for uh, those who are age six years old to nine years old, we bring our kids uh, camping. Okay, this is one of the pictures I have. This is with my son, Ryan. Uh, this was last year, 2013. And every year I get to go. Okay, why? Because I have four children. And uh, from eight, my 18-year-old when he was still young to my 15-year-old now and to the uh, let's say my my 11 year old. He, he it was his last year last year, and then uh, this you know I still have a five year old, so I'm now a stockholder for the me and my dad camp. All right, so every year I'm there, uh, but it, in a while it's it's fun when you're there. It's wonderful when you get there. It's nice to fellowship with other people. How many of you know 
I don't know if that's, you're kind of like me. It's not really something that, it's not my thing. Okay, I'd rather be in an air-conditioned room, okay? Uh, but, you know, pitching tents and, and, and putting together, you know, uh, we would cook uh, in the evenings. Actually, every meal, okay, this is chicken nuggets. It's chicken nuggets, nuggets, lunch, breakfast, dinner, okay? So it's like, <laughs> that's the easiest thing, okay? Just pour on some oil, that, you know, and that's it. Just fry them, all right? If it's not chicken nuggets, it's tocino or, or something like that. Uh, e- easiest thing, all right? Sometimes we just bring the egg or the adobo. How many of you know adobo, you know, tastes better as the days go by, all right? So somebody cooks it at home and brings it. I, we bring it, and so adobo, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, okay? So, but anyway... Every year, my wife would, you know, remind me and say, you know, sunblock, okay, <laughs> a whole day of activity. Uh, you know, how many of you moms here, you know, you're concerned about uh, the sunburns of your, sh- your children? So my wife would always say, you know, put sunblock. Or some of the other moms said, make sure you brush your kids' teeth, okay? Uh, because sometimes they go back home and they say, oh, mom, I, did never, I didn't even brush my teeth for two days, all right? Uh, so they, they, they're back after uh, the camping, they haven't brushed their teeth, okay? They're, they're, they're you know, yellowish and all, okay? But anyway, so, but, but this one, okay, you know, my wife would call me, hey, sunblock, you know, she would text me, she would message me, and then I'd respond, sunblock, oops, okay? So I would forget. But anyway, many of you, um, you know, like, I don't know if you're like me, it's, it's something that, you know, when there with my children, I enjoy it, but it's not something that I actually look forward to, pitching the tent and cooking all that. And in the book, um, Hole in Our Holiness, Kevin DeYoung uh, said something like this. He said, sure, it would be great to be a better person, and you do hope to avoid the really big sins, but you figure, since we're saved by grace, holiness is not required of you. And frankly, your, your life seems to be fine without it. And some people have this attitude, okay, it's, it's like camping, I mean, I... I appreciate people who would, you know, make their, di- make their lives a little difficult for a couple of days, um, you know, and, but it's really not my thing. And so some people would say, you know, holiness, you know, I appreciate people and I, uh, you know, it's great. I salute people who pursue holiness, but it's really not my thing. And to tell you frankly, it's just, you know, it's just that, uh, like, like that book says, you know, my life seems fine without it. And in fact, I don't want to add something else to my plate that it, my life seems already impossible in and of itself with all the things I'm going through. And then add pursuit of holiness on top of that. And so what, do, what does it mean? What does it entail? What we're, what we're going to do today, we're going to put some foundations, lay foundation in our, at least uh, 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 in terms of our knowledge of what it means to pursue holiness and where does that all start? I want to start with this statement to say that God is holy. All right? That God is holy. This is his attribute. When you say God is holy, these are three things that, I, that come to mind. Number one, cut above the rest. Number two, holy in his nature. Number three, he's morally pure. Let me explain this. Cut above the rest. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, you'll notice I'm, I'm going to be throwing a lot of scriptures. I'll be in teaching mode today uh, because I need to lay foundation. There are a lot of, you know, messages that are, you know, there are a couple of, there are two types of messages. Messages that you want to hear and messages that you need to hear. This one you need to hear. There's a lot of messages that makes, you know, f- you know it's fun and, and cool and, and makes you, you know, uh, encourages you a lot. But this one I pray that God would lodge in truth in your soul by which foundations would be built in your life. Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, there is none holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you, none besides him. No other God besides him, the Bible says in 1 Samuel. One of my favorite theologians, um, his name is R.C. Sproul. He said it this way. He said, the primary meaning of a holy or, or holy is separate. It comes from an ancient word that means to cut or to separate. Where you would get set apart. Perhaps even more accurate would be the phrase, a cut above something. When we find a garment or another piece of merchandise that, it's, that is outstanding, that it has superior excellence, we use the expression that it is a cut 
above the rest. And so when you say God is holy, he is a cut above the rest, meaning he is all on, uh, he has a category on, of, all on, on his own, and he is to be compared to no one, cut above the rest. Number two, he's holy in his nature. I don't know if you've noticed when you read the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah encountered the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw a vision of the Lord. And in that vision, you know, he was in the temple, sees a vision, the angels making a declaration. They were saying, holy, holy, holy. Two thoughts there. Number one, he said it three times, or at least the angels declared it three times, which a lot of scholars say, you know, this really is an evidence of the Trinity. Okay, holy, holy, holy. Number two, not only is that the observation, but also this, he, they, they, the seraphims and the, the, the angels shouted or declared holy, 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 not love, 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 not grace, 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 or kindness, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. Which tells us and tells me that that is his supreme attribute and that all that he does is holy he is holy in love he is holy in his judgments he is holy in his mercy he is holy in his kindness holy judgments holy love holy mercy that's who he is that's his attribute and then he's mor morally pure the bible says in psalm 24 verse 3 who shall ascend to the hill of the lord and who shall stand in his holy place God is holy. That's his moral attribute. That is, his, you know, he is moral in his deeds. He's holy in his deeds. Now, let's get into the word. What are the implications then? If God is holy, what then, how does that apply to us? And, and, and many of you here, you know, you come to church and, and, you know, it's good to hear theological thought. And we, not, we need to be theologically sound. But we want to be able to bring that into daily life and daily application. What does this mean? How does this apply and what are the implications to us? Romans chapter 2, we're going to get into the word. Let's read this together. If you're there, could you stand on your feet to read scripture together? We stand to honor the word of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 5, I'm reading from ESV. Essentials of victory, okay? But because your hand of impenitent and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. To one or to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking... And do not, do not obey the truth, the obey, uh, but obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Verse 12. For all who have sinned. Who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Let's pray. Father, we commit to you this moment. Lord, when Paul talked about, Lord, judgment and the wrath of God. And all of us will perish as a result because of our sin. Lord, I pray that you would use these words that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, preached to the church in Rome. So, Father God, I pray that we would have open hearts today. And we would understand what the scripture says. We would hear what the Spirit has to say to the church today. Lord, I pray that you would, you would, you would begin to settle our hearts, open our hearts, open our ears, so that we could use this moment to hear your voice. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul in AD, sometime AD 57. It was a letter written to the church in Rome. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And it actually became sort of a systematic theology type of manual for the church then and the church today. Why? 
Because a lot of the principles, a lot of the theological thought, a lot of the doctrines of, of, of a Christ follower and the church were found there about righteousness, about salvation, about the future things to come, about, you know, the plan of God in our lives. And just um, a lot of these uh, teachings he was able to put in there in the book of Romans. It would be a good book to read. Those of you who don't read the Bible yet systematically, uh, you just, you know, jump, what will I read today? Mm, okay, here, this one. Well, might be a good one to do chapter 1 today, chapter 2 to tomorrow, chapter 3 the next day, uh, systematically throughout this week. It's a good book to read. Now, let me go ahead and find the ap our implications, rather, because God is holy, then how does this affect us now number one i have three thoughts here three implications number one because god is holy man's sin has brought about god's wrath okay i told you this won't be a, a really uh, encouraging message today okay but uh, this is what the truth of god is okay man's sin has brought about the wrath of god where does this say it the bible says in romans chapter 2 but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. You see, the scripture tells us through Paul that because of your sin, because of my sin, because of our sin, it has risen up and it has caused the wrath of God. Because God hates sin. God abhors sin. See, God's wrath means that he's intensely, he intensely hates all sin. All of it. Hates it with a passion. Let me explain this in daily setting. A few weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I read an article about a man who um, committed a crime in San Juan, somewhere in San Juan. He got a child, and he abused the child. And this man did not just abuse the child, but raped this child. And after raping this child, killed this child. And this child was 11 months old. Okay? And so just b basing on your reaction, the same reaction I had was just, it was sickening. It was heart-wrenching. It was something that's like, in my heart, something has to be done. I have the daughter of my own, all right? And, and I, those of you who have children, that would break your heart just to hear that news. And so, again, it, it played in my mind, and, and the thought was, what if? What if, you know, I mean, the guy was caught. And what if the guy stands in front of the judge and the judge says, well, I could see that you're sorry and remorseful. You're crying. And it looks like you're very sincere. And because you look sincere, you can go home. I'll let you go. How many of you here would be upset with that action? Right? And so I would. In fact, everything in me would try to protest. Okay? If that were so. And that's just that situation okay and so it is it, it would be difficult for me to respect a judge who will let go of sin unpunished or of a crime okay without justice you see if you and I uh, uh, let me rephrase it this way okay it is going to be difficult for you and I to worship a God who allows sin and let's go, let go of, he allows the, 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 the guilty to go unpunished. It would be, it, it wouldn't be worthy of, he wouldn't be worthy of worship if he was one who would allow sin to continue to reign. There will be a day of recompense. And you might say, why is it not happening? There will be a day of accounting, the Bible says. In fact, we just read that. There will be a day of wrath where the, the wrath of God will be poured out to the people that are sinful. It's going to happen. 
Okay, I, I, I wish I could say it another way. I wish I was, I was not, uh, you know, I was not um, sounding like a, you know, hellfire and brimstone type of person. But that's just how what the scripture says. You know, you go read it, you wrestle with the truth. Yeah. I'm just here to preach the gospel. Okay, and so that's the first thought here. That because of your sin and our, my sin, the wrath of God has been stirred. Number two. Because God is holy, sin has to be judged. Sin has to be judged. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, second part of that, or chapter 2 verse 5, B, for the day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. Which means everything you've done, everything I've done in thought, in word, and in deed, that's going to get judged. That brings holy fear in my heart. Yes. Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The word of God knows what's in your heart. God knows what's, in the, what's inside of us. You know, before you even think it, he already knows. That's fascinating, but at the same time scary for me. You think about it. He knows what you're thinking about now. He knows what your thoughts out, uh, thoughts about the future, about tomorrow, or the plans that you have. He knows every single thing that goes through our mind. I mean, I, I thought about this. You know, what if God had uh, had placed an LED screen on our heads, right? And every thought would show up there. Okay, that would be pretty scary, right? <laughs> but, you know, he doesn't need an LED screen. It's going to get exposed one day. Yeah. Matthew 12, verse 36. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account, an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Every word that we speak, every word that we speak, there's going to be an accounting. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says, For we must, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, in this body, what we've done. We're going to appear in the judgment seat of Christ. How many of you know this is a sobering thought if you dwell on it? Every thought, every word, every deed. See, we will only understand the depths of our sin when we understand the holiness of God. Yes. To the degree we understand the holiness of God, that's the degree we'll understand the sinfulness of our hearts. Okay? A few years ago, I had the opportunity to play with, uh, I mean, I, to this day I still try, okay? That's the operative word, to try to play basketball, okay, with friends. And, um, you know, with my high school friends, we have a league, and, and there's, we, I st we still get to play. And, you know, because, because I guess I'm, I'm taller than, than many of them, at least in our batch. There's a lot of them that are taller in other batches. But, so I, 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 I get to play either center or number four, power forward. And so um, whenever we play, uh, you know, I get to, you know, grab a rebound or two. Or even shoot uh, the ball, okay? And so, so you know, alam niyo yung pag nakashoot ka ng bola, takbong mayaman. Yung uh, they call that takbong mayaman, is like yung, di ba? Like, di ba? It's like, and then you run, you run, you run backwards, di ba? It's like after you shoot the ball, it's like takbong ganon, di ba? So, but and so, uh, you know, because you, I, I get to make a shot, right? But a few years ago, <laughs> I got to play with XPBA players, okay, professional basketball players, and so it was a really an opportunity and. It's a, it's a privilege for me. Okay? And so, um, and, you know, I, I, I didn't know what was coming. So in my mind, it was like, you know, <laughs> XPBA players. Like, this, these guys are vintage, you know. They're old, right? <laughs> I mean, these guys, um, you know. And, but so, I, I played. I didn't even make it through the second quarter. Okay, there are four quarters, by the way. Okay, I didn't make it through the, the second quarter because... 
you know, my tongue was really as longer than Michael Jordan's, okay? It was, it was not because I was, you know, flaunting my tongue, but because it was just tired, okay, dog tired. And so, you know, I, in my thought, you know, with my friends, I felt I was like this, okay? But to the PBA players, I was like this, all right? I was like, you know, hindi takbong mayaman eh, takbong pagod eh, diba? So, tak- eh, wala, talagang, didn't even, again, as I said, it was, I can't even explain to you how, what my experience was. It was just embarrassing, okay? Anyway. <laughs> Them, me. Okay? And so, when we compare ourselves with the next guy, or the next person, or your office mate, or your classmate, I'm not as bad as that person, Right? We think it's not. I'm not as sinful as that guy, or you know the, the the cliche that we like to use often. I'm not as bad as Hitler. How many of you know? No one's as bad as Hitler. Okay, no one's as worse as him. And so we we compare with, but but that's not the standard. The standard is Him, God, holy, righteous, just, and we're here. If I can just dig deeper than this stage, I, I'd be way, 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 way down. I can't compare myself to others because we're all, the Bible says all have sinned. And before his eyes, we don't even compare. The, own, the, the moment we understand okay, the depths of our sin is to the degree when we understand the holiness of God. Let me try to wrap this up. Number three, because God is holy, man will perish as payment for sin. You and I will have to pay for sin. Romans 2 verse 12, the Bible says, All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. In other words, what Paul is saying here, even if you don't understand the Old Testament law, if you don't understand what, what, what the scripture says about the Ten Commandments and all that, you're oblivious of it, you will still perish because you have overstepped boundaries whether you even realize it or not. And then it says, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. If you say, I'm living by the law, I'm following the Ten Commandments, then the Bible says in James, if you break one part of the law, you break the whole law. Okay? Now, question. How then can we escape God's wrath, not suffer judgment and payment for sin? How then can we do this? How can we escape the wrath of God? If it's coming, if I am sinful, and if I have sinned, if I have overstepped the boundaries, how then can I escape this? Well, the Bible says, be holy. Be holy for I am holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, I can see in your faces that's a little problematic. Wait, wait, wait. Be holy, okay? I don't know if I can even claim to be one. Okay? And you see, Bible says, God said, be holy because I am holy. And without holiness, we cannot have a relationship with God. We cannot see Him. Okay? Now, look at what Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's a caveat. Don't you realize that those who don't do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge, indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. Look at what the next verse says. Some of you were once like that. I was part of that list. (laughs) Some of you were once like that. But look at what the scripture says. But you were cleansed. But you were made holy. Okay, 
you were cleansed. You and I were cleansed and you and I were made holy. You know, look at those two words. You were made holy. You didn't do holiness. You were made holy. Your position and condition before God, you are made holy not because of what you did, the holy works you've done, but because you were given a standing, right standing, you were justified. Why? How? The Bible says you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. Think about this for a moment. Next verse, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, we've been made holy. There it is again. We don't do good. We don't do holy works so that you can be holy. It says you've been made holy. It has to be made. You, be, you have to go through. You have to be made holy before you become holy. And so the Bible says through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once for all. You know, I've been reading through Leviticus recently. And... When, when they talked about their, you know, every year, they, had, there was, they would call the, the day of, there was a day of atonement. It was Yom Kippur. And it was a, a day where the high priest would come. You know, the way the, the, way the high priest wears his robe. Um, it had pomegranates, okay. And then it had um, bells at the hem. Bells, okay. And so, let me illustrate, okay. There's the outer courts. There's the inner courts. And there's the Holy of Holies. That's the inner sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was. Okay? Indiana Jones, Ark of the Covenant. Okay, I mean, obviously that's not biblical. Okay, but just, okay. They go in the inner, uh, the outer courts. The high priest comes. Inner court and then Holy of Holies. He has to atone for his own sin before he has to atone or he can atone for the sin of the people. And so what he does, he sacrifices for himself. And if, you know, he, he, he wears those bells around his robe and it's, okay, it, it rings. And he goes in the Holy of Holies and there's a rope. Jewish tradition says there's a rope that's tied around his leg. And so he goes in there and those bells ring as he's doing the atonement uh, ceremony. And if the bell no longer rings, that means he's fallen to his death because there was sin found in his heart. The holiness of God strikes him. And so the rope was there. If they no longer hear him, rope is there to pull him out of that location. Okay. Once every year that this, this is done. And when I read, when I read this verse once for all, when Jesus died once for all, it's true that he died once for every one of us. One time for all of us. But you know what once for all also means? Once for every sacrifice. No longer have to be every year. And for, for a Jewish person, there were five offerings they had to offer. They had to sacrifice. There's the meal offering. There's the grain offering. There's the trespass offering. There's the guilt offering. There are five uh, different offerings that they have to do every year. And once all that Okay, has been done, their sins are atoned for. Well, Jesus, when he came, the Bible says he died once for all. You guys getting this? And so, what is the implication for you and for me? See, on the cross, the most violent expression of God's wrath and justice was witnessed. You could see the most violent expression of God's wrath. Why? When Jesus was on that cross, all of your sin, my sin. Now think about that for a moment. Just that if, if, if it's just that one sin of, of that guy in San Juan okay, who, who raped a, an 11-month-old baby, his sin times however many people, billions of people lived on planet Earth. Add all that. All of your sin and my sin placed the wrath. If there was a cup of wrath, all of that has been poured out on Jesus Christ. So that when he was on that cross, okay. That's why if you remember, he, he, one of his last words, he said, 
Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? There were two implications why he said that. One was, it was, it, he was identifying when sin, when we are, I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced this, when you're in sin, there seems to be a separation from God. You can't break through the presence of God. And he was identifying with what God, what man would go through. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 21 says. And so that was the first implication. But also the second one was this. He was quoting from Psalm 22, which was of a greater uh, uh, declaration. Why he said it was a messianic psalm saying that I am the Messiah. He's declaring I am the Savior. By me quoting Psalm 22, this means I am your Savior. I am receiving the wrath of God for you on, on, for, on, on, for your sake. That's what was going on there in, Cal in Calvary. The most violent expression of God's wrath and justice seen on the cross. See, he took, he took our place. All of God's judgment and wrath that was supposed to be poured on you and me, he took it. He took it. One last thought. You see, God's holiness demanded a sacrifice. And I couldn't fulfill that sacrifice. And yet Jesus did that on my behalf. Did that on my behalf. And so how does this apply to us today as I land this thing? You know, I, I, I was thinking about this. Um, you know, growing up in the culture that we grew up in, I don't know if you've heard this before. It's, it's actually very Filipino to say, you know, the reason why I'm going through what I'm going through, the, the problems I'm going through, the, the trials I'm going through, because I feel God's punishing me. I don't know if you've heard that before. Let me say it in Tagalog, okay? Just to bring that to application for all of us. Ang dahilan kung bakit ako nagkakaroon ng maraming problema dahil piling ko pinaparusahan ako ng Diyos. Have you ever heard that before? See, if you are, if you've been rescued by God, if you've given your life to Christ, there is no longer any ounce of wrath of God to be poured out on you. Why? Because all of that has been poured on to Jesus. Okay? Which means, whatever you're going through today, the difficulty, the problem, it may be God's going, getting you through a discipline process, or maybe it's training. God's training you for greater things in the future. But it's never about punishment. You see, His work in your life is never punitive, but always restorative. He's trying to restore something that was lost in there. The imago dei, the image of God, whatever God has started in your heart, in your life, the image and likeness of Jesus in you. That's what he's trying to restore. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next three weeks. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for tonight. Or thank you for your word that gives us wisdom and gives us insight. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that, Lord, let your word begin to settle. And Lord, let the Holy Spirit pound as with a hammer the truth of the word of God in our hearts tonight. And Lord, I realize it, it's a, it may be a difficult message for some to swallow. But Lord, we know it's a truth that will set us free. And so Lord, we pray that you would use your word in a powerful way. Let me pray for two things for two groups of people tonight. Some of you here today, you're, it, it's a revelation today for you. You're going through a difficult situation. You're going through a tough time and you're thinking, 
Lord, did I, what did I do to receive punishment from you? Well, God's clarifying to you today, as, as you are a Christ follower, if you have been rescued by God, His work in your life is not punitive. It's actually restorative. He's doing something. And so let me just pray for you. If that's you today, could you just raise your hand? Lord, I pray for the men and women who are going through a difficult situation today. I pray that they would embrace your restorative work in their lives. That they would see that you're after their good, ultimately your glory. And so Father God, I, I pray that as they embrace the season of their life, they would see your hand at work. That they would not think of, Lord, the circumstances or the things that they're going through as punishment. But Lord, it's a work that you're doing to accomplish greater things in their lives. You can put your hands down. Some of you here, you need to give your life to Christ. And you know today that you can never be saved by good works. Because none of our good works, the Bible says our good works is like filthy rags. It, don't, it won't even match. It won't even compare. And so, if you're here today and you say, you know, Paula, I'm, I'm, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I understand now that Jesus paid a price on my behalf. I owed a debt I couldn't pay and he paid a debt he didn't owe. Just raise your hand if that's you. I believe there's a few of you that need to make that decision tonight. Give your life to Christ. Surrender to Him. Raise your hand. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Praise God. It's all right. Just raise your hand. Anybody else? Praise God. I can see your hands. God bless you. Lord, I just pray for these that are raising their hands. Lord, are making decision to give their lives to you. Say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, those of you are raising your hands, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you that you rescued me. And the Bible says, Lord, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. And so, Lord, tonight, I receive your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand as we end? I want to encourage you as so you go out this week. God is a holy God. It's worthy of our worship. That while you and I, because of our right standing with Him, can enter into the Holy of Holies anytime, He's still worthy of worship. He's still holy. Cut above the rest. And you know what, what that should do for all of us? When you come here and worship, you give your all to Him. It's no longer just like, oh, you know, trying to be cool. You know, I like that worship service, our uh, worship leader's jacket today. You know, you're criticizing, and it's like, listen, just forget about all that. Or you know, the, the drums too loud, or guitar strings broken again, and just lift up your hands and worship. Amen. That should propel you to worship the Holy God, and not just in church, even at home, wherever you are. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, Lord, your word today. May your righteousness, peace, and joy go with us. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, keep that in our minds today, even as we leave today. You're a holy God that deserve all, not some, all of our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. God bless you. See you next week.